Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark 16. Let's make up for lost time here. Uh, Mark chapter 16 is the last chapter of Mark. How about that? Um, so let's read from verse 9, actually, and we will read through to the end of the book, the whole book. Mark chapter 16, verse 9 says, Now when he arose, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Of course not. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. 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 Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this, um, this book we've been able to study for 80 weeks or so. We thank you for the happy ending. Uh, we thank you that this passage begins with a, a resurrected Savior. And we thank you that this is also a happy beginning, that it begins with the planting of the church and, and the preaching of the gospel to all nations. And we thank you that, that you've invited us um, to such a great work. We thank you for inviting us to uh, a church uh, with a living Savior and a living King. And we thank you for uh, giving us this good work to do of preaching the gospel and spreading the gospel and doing what we can to have this gospel preached to, uh, to every creature in every nation. Bless our study of this passage. Uh, give us ears to hear and hearts to understand and hearts that are willing to obey uh, whatever your spirit would teach us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. So, coming to the last half of Mark chapter 16. Um, and this is actually a passage that causes some of the scholars in their ivory towers to... Um, to bicker. This, uh, this passage <laughs> makes people argue, and uh, there's a disagreement about the authorship of the passage we just read. Um, I alluded to this debate last week, but if you weren't here, I'll fill you in. A lot of you weren't. Everyone was gone for Easter, but welcome back. Um, in the early manuscripts of the New Testament, um, Mark ends in verse 8 of chapter 16. Um, with the empty tomb and the angel saying, he is not here, he is risen. Uh, the, the oldest complete Greek New Testament, which is called the Codex Sinaiticus, if you remember from that Bible class we did a while back, um, the Codex Sinaiticus, it ends with verse 8, but the rest of the page is carefully lined and prepared for, it seems like, the rest of the book. Um, so the oldest few copies don't have this. The majority of the ancient texts do have this passage, but some people see this as a problem, and, and those wishing to discredit the gospel, of course, see the last 12 verses as maybe you know a false addition put in in order to spread this rumor of the resurrection or something like that. So let's address this. I think this is interesting stuff. Um, first, I'd like you to notice that even if we finished the book with verse 8 and we, we didn't study the last 12 verses, uh, we still end with eyewitnesses of the resurrection. The tomb is empty, and the angel had declared to the women, he is not here, he is risen. Um, however, I'd like you to know that um, you don't have to leave off the last 12 verses. You don't have to question these last 12 verses. Should these be in my Bible? Well, yes. Um, there's a reason they didn't ask you what should go in the Bible and what shouldn't. 
We're going to study these passages along with the rest of the book, seeing them as inspired scripture. And it does seem, full disclosure, it does seem that these verses were not with the original story that Mark wrote. Um, either the last page of his document was lost, um, or he intentionally ended his part of the account with verse 8. Um, his authorship does seem to end with verse 8, and then someone else picks up with verse 9. Um, like I said, the earliest manuscripts don't include these verses, and when you look at the, the passage in Greek, it has several phrases and, and words that don't appear anywhere else in Mark, that just don't really fit with his authorship. But I would like to point out that just because Mark didn't write it doesn't mean it's not inspired. Uh, Mark didn't write Matthew, Luke, or Romans either. Um, it's kind of that, like, uh, you hear people say that white chocolate, it's not real chocolate. It's like, you're not supposed to, like, well, white chocolate's not real chocolate. It's like, well, neither are French fries, but it's still good. You know, it's like, who cares if it's not real chocolate? So, you know, it's, it's just, there it is. So Mark, the, Mark 9 through, what is it, verse 20, is probably not written by Mark, uh, but it is inspired scripture. Um, you have, this, this is a, a common thing even in books of the Bible. You have in the Old Testament what we call the books of Moses. Even Jesus refers to the authorship of Moses with the first five books of the Bible. And the fact that Moses wrote those books is pretty much universally accepted. Okay? However, you reach the end of the fifth book in De Deuteronomy, and Moses dies. So did he write that part? How did he pull that off? It seems likely that he left the last part of the pages blank, and Joshua probably filled in the rest. And that's okay. It doesn't take away from the fact that those words were written by men as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the last verses of Mark, they are inspired scripture. They were well known uh, to the early church fathers, even quoted. Um, they even quoted from this ending of Mark as early as 100 AD. So yes, your Bible is true. It's still accurate. It's complete. Mark 16, verse 9 through 20 has been accepted by the church since its authorship. This is just something I find interesting, but it need not shake your faith. Just know that we're changing gears in our book to a friend of Mark's. He filled in the rest, and this is his take on the end of the story. That seems to be what happened. Mark 9, or Mark 16, verse 9 says, Now when he arose on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and they, as they mourned and wept, and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. You can look at this passage uh, further in the Gospel of John. The other women went back away, uh, away from the tomb, but Mary, Mary Magdalene, stayed behind in the garden and asked a man who she thought was the gardener where they had put the body of Jesus. And that man, of course, was Jesus. And he said, why don't you go tell him what, you, what you've seen? From what we... Uh, we do know of the women who went to the tomb. Mary had the most storied past. Uh, she'd had seven demons cast out of her, it says. And, you know, like I said, you don't catch demons like you catch a cold. Uh, you gotta be, you're a pretty rotten person already if you've come that far. Um, she wasn't just the nice Christian church lady, um, but she loved Jesus. And she was the, the one who stayed back at the tomb the longest out of any of the women that came. And she was the one who was able to stay and see Christ and receive the marching orders for going and telling the disciples. Um, so she, she did. She went and told them she had seen Jesus, but they didn't believe. They were mourning. They were sorrowful. It probably seemed too good to be true on the one hand. And it probably just seemed too strange to be true. You know, why didn't they believe? Well, resurrection is unprecedented. Um, it, it's something phenomenal. It is something that requires a little bit of evidence for someone to believe, okay? Um, we, don't, we don't really support the idea of a blind faith or the leap of faith, as if you're just going to jump off a cliff and hope something catches you. That is not a Christian faith. Our faith is based on fact. And the disciples were, it was okay that they, you know, would have wanted evidence. Mary got evidence. She saw Jesus. They got evidence before that. The angel had declared it to be true, and they had the empty tomb. Evidence is fine. It's fine to look for evidence. The disciples hear this from a woman, and they think, you're probably just as emotional as we are right now. 
we don't believe you. So on the one hand, I'd say we shouldn't be too hard on these 11 guys because resurrection is not an easy thing to believe in. And some evidence would be helpful. However, on the other hand, we have to realize that the disciples did have evidence at this time. They had two very important pieces of evidence. First, they had the prophecies of Jesus. Jesus said that he would die and rise again from the dead in three days. He said this in Mark 8, 9, and 10. Three chapters in a row. He says, I am going to die, but I'm not going to stay dead. That was evidence. They believed everything else he said, right? And the second piece of evidence would be the eyewitness accounts um, from Mary and the other women eventually of the empty tomb, the angel's declaration, and the risen Jesus himself. She saw him and touched him. So they had some evidence. Eyewitness, eyewitness accounts are worth a lot of evidence in a courtroom, right? So they don't believe yet. In verse 12 and 13, that gives another account um, that's more fully explained in Luke. We'll read it here. It says, after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Hmm. This is the uh, famous story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Okay? These two guys walking, they're sad because Jesus died and they expected him to be the Messiah. Jesus walks up alongside them and gives them the best Bible study ever given and explains to them in Scripture why the Christ needed to die and why they shouldn't have been surprised about that. Um, and then they say, why don't, why don't you come and eat with us? And he says, no, 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 it's getting late. And he said, they say, no, that it says it, they compelled him to stay. So he stays with them, and when they eat their meal, they break the bread, and it says, in the breaking of bread, he was made known to them. When they start to eat with him, then they see, that's Jesus, and then he's gone. Cool story, really cool story. So Mark, he doesn't include a lot of those details. That's in Luke, the last chapter of Luke. Uh, Mark, or whoever the author of these verses was, what he's doing is he's listing the eyewitness accounts to give credit to the resurrection, and who knows, maybe put a little embarrassment on the 11 disciples. I'm not sure. But he's listing, says Mary saw him, then these two other guys saw him, and they told the disciples, and the disciples still didn't believe. So verse 14 comes along, it says, Later he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now, it's interesting to me first that why Jesus would wait to appear before the 11. Like they are his closest friends, right? We don't know a lot about the two guys on the road to Emmaus. How come they got to see Jesus before the 12 who had been living with him? How come, you know, I mean, you could say Mary got to see because she was up early on Sunday morning and was there and stayed. So, But other people saw Jesus before the disciples, and he waited. He waited until revealing himself to them. And I, can't, I don't know why exactly. I just have to ask him, I guess. But I suspect that the disciples could handle it. I expect that Jesus knew that their faith could get stretched a little bit more thin than the disciples on the road to Emmaus, um, who may have, who were already in despair and and losing, and and maybe, just maybe, the disciples, in their in their period of grief and mourning and unbelief, uh, maybe that was laying the foundation for further growth for them. Um, they would be forgiven yet another sin, uh, and those who are forgiven much love much. So the disciples had to wait. They had to wait. And wait, they did. And now finally, Jesus shows up to the remaining disciples. Now at this point, they had heard it from Mary. They had heard it from the two on the road to Emmaus. And Peter and John at this point had even been to the tomb and seen that it was empty. They had witnessed that it was empty and the grave clothes were lying folded on the, on the stone. But these were not the ones telling people about the resurrection. Uh, they weren't even sure they believed it themselves. And when Jesus shows up... Uh, he gives a rebuke. Now, what do you think Jesus' rebuke is like? Some of you probably don't have to imagine. Um, you've probably felt it. It is hard, and it is gentle. One of the uh, rebukes that's recorded for us in John is the rebuke he gives to Thomas. Uh, we call him Doubting Thomas. He said, I won't believe until I touch the wounds and put my hand in the side. And so Jesus, he, he does rebuke him and says, it's better to believe 
even though you haven't seen. But he does invite Thomas closer to himself than I'm sure Thomas had ever been. Um, actually under his skin. Uh, to put his wound, his hand in the wound and to touch the wounds on his hands. So Christ's rebuke, it is hard. It is gentle. You can, ex you can expect the rebuke of God to hurt your feelings a little bit. But in when God rebukes his children, he brings them closer to himself than they've ever been. And that's what happened with, with Thomas and others. You can look at Jacob wrestling with the angel of God, a very intimate thing to do. Uh, in other cases, when Jesus rebukes them, I don't want you to think of an angry principal. Uh, he's bringing his friends back to where they need to be. In between verse 14 and 15, there's actually a a passage of 40 days that we're missing here. Um, you can look at Acts chapter 1 for that, Acts, Acts 1 chapter uh, chapter 1 verse 3. After Jesus rose from the dead, he stayed on the earth for 40 days and appeared to many in one crowd as uh, 500 people at a time. Actually, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. But after that period of 40 days, um, verse 15 happens, and the, the Great Commission, which we'll read, at an uh, unknown location, even though they've built churches where they figure they think it happened, but you really have no idea where it happened. Uh, right before Christ's ascension into heaven. And these next verses record um, really the famous last words. Um, not before death, but before departure. And these are the parting words of Jesus to the first Christians, really, the first believers, the, the apostles. And this is the Gospel of Mark's version of what we call the Great Commission. Um, go ahead and read verse 15 through verse 18. It says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. We're going to spend most of the time today taking apart these verses. Um, we do call this the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. Um, you could say that at this moment in time, this is where the disciples become apostles. Those are two different titles. Uh, a disciple is someone who is disciplined in following a leader. An apostle is someone who is sent from a leader. Okay, So the direction changes. You're following a leader or your leader is sending you um, to do something. As you can see in this case, the first word spoken in the Great Commission is go. So the disciples are being sent. They're becoming apostles, sent ones. And it would be easy... Um, it would be easy to see the word go as kind of the central command of this passage and then you know, make a big sermon about how we're all supposed to leave. It's not the central command of this passage. Um, it'd be easy for me to craft a, craft a message about how the main part is going, but when I look at this passage in, uh, in Greek, it's not what I see. The word go actually is not, it's not a command. It's not in the imperative. Um, it's more of a condition. Uh, and I've heard someone else who knows a lot more about Greek than I do say that you could read this as you are going. As you are going. So you might read this as, as you are going into all the world, preach. And so it's, it's assumed that the apostles would be going. It's assumed that they will be taking the, the good news of the gospel throughout the whole world and in order to preach it. But the real imperative, the one command in this whole passage, is actually that one word, preach. It's the only word in the imperative. It's the only command in this passage, preach. In Matthew, Matthew phrases this passage a little bit differently, and he puts the imperative on make disciples. Uh, but it, it doesn't mean we shouldn't go. It's assumed that we should. He says, as you are going throughout the whole world. So it's like, I'm, I'm assuming you're going get to that, get that part. Um, if Jesus is assuming you're supposed to be doing something, you can be confident that you are indeed supposed to be doing that thing. Uh, in fact, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells the disciples clearly that they will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He says, you know, you guys got to get going. Get going. Spread the gospel, not just here, but here, there, and everywhere. So the idea that, that we as Christians and they as the first apostles should go, it's very real. 
Uh, Romans chapter 10 speaks of the importance of missionary work. When it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Paul starts this little uh, hypothetical conversation. He says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So we're supposed to go. That's, that's just part of the deal. That's part of the deal of Christianity that you bought into, okay? Or rather, that you were bought into. The church does have an obligation to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to the world. Um, however, this is, the why, this is why the word go is not the command and the word preach is. Our command is to preach, or in Matthew it's to make disciples. That's the imperative, that's the command. And to do that, we are to go. Because once you make all the disciples you can in one place, well, go find some more people and make some more disciples. Um, but we must never think that because someone goes to another country, they're a missionary. Um, Christian missions involves traveling sometimes, a lot of times. It involves humanitarian aid sometimes. It involves building things sometimes, but it must always, always involve or support the preaching of the word because that's what missions is. There are a lot of good missionary organizations out there. I'd like to believe that most of them have a good understanding of the Great Commission. It's why they're doing what they're doing. But unfortunately, I do know that there are some that equate the going with missions more than the preaching. Well, we went, especially short-term mission trips. They have this terms, you know, it's like get a group of people, throw them on a bus, uh, take them to an airport, throw them on a plane, have them go, and then they'll take pictures of themselves with brown kids and then come back, and then that was their mission trip. It's like that wasn't a mission trip. Did you preach? Did you preach? Um, there's a trip, and it's great, and there's nothing wrong with taking trips. That's fine. Um, but it needs to be involved in. You need to be supporting or preaching yourself, supporting a preacher or preaching yourself for it to be in line with the Great Commission. There's only one command in this passage, and it's not go. It's preach. That's the one command. The disciples are commanded to preach wherever they went. And this was their most important task. Now, as we studied the first half of the Gospel of Mark way back when, we saw um, as early as chapter 114 and through that Jesus' primary ministry was preaching. Um, now, Mark actually has more hands-on ministry, more healings and miracles and, and you know, service than a lot, of the, than a lot of the other Gospels. There's only four. Um, than the other Gospels. Uh, Mark includes Jesus serving people and loving people. But the miracles and the other aspects of his ministry are always done in support of his preaching. We saw that in, in the first half of Mark. And now Jesus is passing that baton, uh, and he, just as Jesus came to preach, he is sending his men out to preach. In verse 15, it says, Jesus tells them to preach to every creature. Um, Matthew, in Matthew's Great Commission, uh, it says every nation, which probably gives the meaning a little better. Several centuries ago, a guy named uh, Francis from Assisi, he took this literally and started preaching to birds and small woodland creatures, Disney princess style. Um, and uh, I don't recommend this method. Don't be Snow White. Um, but do be asking yourself how you can be bringing the gospel to all nations. Perhaps you should go yourself just to make sure the job gets done right. Just an idea. In verse 16, it says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. I really like the way this verse is phrased because there's still, there still has only been one command so far. In what Jesus has said, in the whole section of red letters, there is still one command, and it's to preach. Verse 16 does not say, make people believe. And it does not say, make sure you baptize people a lot. It doesn't say save people, and it certainly doesn't say condemn people. It's not our business. 
That's not, what the, that's not the task that the disciples were given. All that stuff is out of our hands. Jesus is just saying that as you preach, and that's your job, as you evangelize and as you share good news of Jesus with friends, family, and complete strangers, those people will respond in one or two ways, and those responses have consequences, which are not up to you. However, Jesus does say that while the response isn't part of your job, it is an extremely important part of the job. He says very clearly that a person is either in or out depending on where they place their faith. And we'll get to the baptism part in a second because I want to give a few words on that, but just consider this with me for a second. The Christian faith is um, it's binary. Uh, not, not to mean that it's just zeros and ones and that's the only thing we preach, but binary, just it's two, right? It's divided. It's an all or nothing venture. Um, and we have to acknowledge that those who believe will be saved. There's no saved-ish. <laughs> There's no like, I'm kind of saved. I feel saved today, but yesterday was rough. Um, <laughs> tomorrow's not looking good either. Okay, you, if you believe, you will be saved. And those who do not believe will be condemned. And this is uncomfortable stuff. But it is what motivates the command to preach. We have positive motiv motivation for preaching the gospel because we know that to be saved, that means a whole lot. It means a whole lot for us. We benefit from that. We know what that, right? It means we get an eternity of pleasure at the right hand of God. It means having every tear wiped away, no more pain, sorrow, regret. And before, before that, before eternity starts, before heaven starts, it means freedom from the curse of the law that we could never keep, freedom from the power of our flesh, and victory over sin and Satan. Being saved means a lot. In being saved, we get the Holy Spirit who produces love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in our lives. Who wants more of that? I know I do. Okay? That's a benefit of being saved. We have a positive motivation for sharing the gospel because the people you know, you know they have problems, and you know the answer. Right? In our midweek study, and I think I've said it on Sundays before, the, the boiled down sermon of all sermons is the problem is sin, the solution is Jesus. Okay? That's it. Remember that part. And we have a positive motivation because we have the solution. We, we see the problem, we can diagnose the problem, it's sin, and we have the solution, it's Jesus. So we have pot of positive motivation for sharing the gospel. We also have what you might call negative motivation, because those who do not believe will be condemned. Uh, hell is real, and we don't like it. And we have a responsibility to show people who are headed towards a real hell that they can turn around that someone died to save them, that heaven is waiting for them, and that the path they're on is doomed, but that repentance is an option. Evangelism is required of us. Uh, Henry Ironside, good old Bible preacher, he once said, interest in missions is not an elective in God's university of grace. It is something in which every disciple is expected to major in. I'm a Christian majoring in evangelism. Minoring in uh, um, second grade Sunday school classes. I don't know. Uh, that should be part of evangelism, I guess. Before we get to seven, verse 17, I want to briefly mention this bit about baptism. Jesus does say, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. And this does kind of sound like you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Or to state it negatively, if you don't get baptized, you're not going to heaven. That's not what it means. Um, we know from the rest of Scripture that it is the belief uh, that brings us to the grace that saves, right? The thief on the cross would be an excellent example of someone who just didn't get the chance for baptism. But Jesus promised him, you will be with me in paradise. Uh, if you know someone who has made a deathbed confession but was not baptized, you can be confident that they are in heaven. However, at the same time, it would be equally wrong to regard baptism as a non-essential it, it may not be essential to salvation, but it is absolutely essential to obedience. Uh, we're told to be baptized and to baptize others. Jesus told the, believer, told the believer to be baptized. And if you are one, you must do it. It becomes essential as soon as Jesus commands it. Can you imagine Jesus telling you to do something 
and then giving the option of, well, if you feel like it. Like, he's just not that kind of boss. Charles Spurgeon had some good, hard things to say on this. Um, it will be baffling. It's always baffling to me to hear of a, a Christian who's not been baptized for no good reason, really, and there isn't a good reason. Um, there's no good reason I can think of for postponing something of this importance. So Spurgeon, in one of his sermons, he staged an imaginary conversation with the person who had not been baptized because they didn't have to. Because you can be saved and not be baptized. That's a true, a true statement. And his response to this person is, is kind of mean, actually. So I'll read it and let you know that it's him talking, not me. <laughs> he says to the imaginary person on stage with him, What do you mean by non-essential? Will I mean that I can be saved without being baptized? Will you dare to say that wicked sentence over again? I mean that I can be saved without being baptized. You mean creature, so you will do nothing that Christ commands if you can be saved without doing it? You are hardly worth saving at all. A man who always wants to be paid for what he does, whose one idea of religion is that he will do what is essential to his own salvation, only cares to save his own skin, and Christ may go where he likes. Clearly, you are no servant of his. You need to be saved from such a disreputable, miserable state of mind, and I pray the Lord save you. Go Charlie. If you go Charlie, exactly. Yeah. If you're, if you're not interested in obeying your Savior, is he your Savior? Where's the evidence? Those words are strong, but please, if you are in this camp of, well, I don't have to, so I'm not going to, consider your disobedience, because that's what it is, and then reconsider, and then let's find some water. Verse 17, moving on. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. All right, this covers a little bit of what the disciples can look forward to in their new ministry. They are not offered, you know, a corner office with, a good, with windows. Um, it would be extremely dangerous and extraordinarily strange, but they would be supernaturally protected. That's the idea of this passage. So we're going to cover each one of these things individually because uh, they're weird. Uh, but I want you to keep in mind that these are trials that will accompany the disciples while they are spreading the gospel throughout the world. Please don't think of these things as entertainment or showmanship. These are real dangers and real successes that real men have had as they have tried to obey the Lord's command to preach and to make disciples of all nations. Um, also, I'd like to point out the obvious, I, I hope the obvious, um, and say that these are not all tests of true faith. So I don't want you to think that, well, I'm not really a, a Christian unless I speak in tongues and pick up snakes. Mm, no. These aren't proofs of faith, and they're not even things that I would say you should seek after. Remember, there's one imperative. There's one command in this passage, and it's not to drink strychnine. Okay? The one command is to preach. And then he's saying, and then a bunch of this other stuff is going to happen. People are going to get saved, and some people aren't. And some of you will speak in new tongues, and some of you will pick up snakes and not be bit. And some of you will heal people by putting your hands on them. It's going to be great. But your job is to preach. Just like it's not your job to save people or to condemn people, it's not up to you to see how many of these miracles you can perform. It's your job to preach. It is to evangelize. It is to share the good news. And if you get really into your job of preaching, then some of these things might happen too. Who knows? First mentioned, the followers of Jesus would cast out demons. This is something Jesus did a lot of in his earthly ministry. And this is something the disciples did a lot of in spreading the gospel. And if you go to the right places to minister, this is something that you can, can certainly be encountered today. Uh, we do live in a world right now that has a spiritual element as well as a physical. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against just the physical, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, our main enemy in this fight we're fighting, is a spiritual enemy and not a physical or political or any other kind of enemy. There are spiritual realities, and we fight against them. However, as Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to him. 
which means that the demons that are working against the power of God and the spiritual darkness, the spiritual warfare that happens whenever we try to do something cool, they are fighting from a place of defeat uh, while we are fighting from a place of victory. When the disciples would enter into regions where Jesus was unknown, they would encounter demonic opposition, but they would be victorious over it. James 4 verse 7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because he's already lost. Next, it says that the followers of Jesus would speak in new tongues. And again, I would like to point out that this is not the evidence of a true believer, but rather something that would accompany the preaching of the gospel. Um, you see in Acts chapter 2, when the apostles are anointed with the Holy Spirit, and then all those around them in the city heard them preaching the gospel in their own languages. And they wondered, how can this be? How can I be hearing you know, this in my own language? Um, and the gospel was preached, and 3,000 people were saved. I don't want you to think that you need to fake speaking in tongues in order to prove the depth of your faith um, or your spirituality or something. Focus on the gospel and the spreading of it. If you want to hear more about the gift of speaking in tongues, which is slightly different than what happens in Acts chapter 2, then come to Bible study in two weeks. Um, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and other spiritual things in pneumatology. In verse 18, things start to get weird if they weren't already. Um, they will take up serpents. Now, uh, you're probably familiar with the weird stories about strange churches in the Ozarks and the Appalachians that have the snake handling services and stuff. Man, I did some really heartbreaking research on that this week. Um, if, it, if people weren't so stupid, this would be comical. Let's go to church and play with rattlesnakes and drink poison. The Bible says it's okay. And then you die and say, well, God wanted me to die. Yeah. No, 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 no. Remember, the only imperative, the only command in this passage is to preach. The rest is, is circumstantial, really. This does not take away from the truth of the passage. In fact, we see clear fulfillment of Jesus' statement in Acts chapter 28. It's actually one of my kids' favorite Bible stories right now, Paul and the snake bite. Paul was, uh, as he would say, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's being taken to Rome aboard a ship. The ship wrecks. They have to swim to the island of Malta. After swimming, everyone's wet and cold, right? So Paul, being the helpful guy that he was, is, help, is helping build a, a campfire. He's carrying a bundle of sticks, and a snake is in the sticks, comes out and bites him, and he shakes it off into the fire and isn't harmed. Um, as a result, the people of Malta had a more favorable view of Paul. At first, they thought he was a god. And because he didn't die and gained some fame, he was able to share the gospel with the leading citizen of the island and, and healed him of a disease, actually. So the sign, you see, the sign of the snake was to support the preaching of the gospel. The end game of that story is still the preaching of the gospel and the making of disciples. That was the point. It wasn't be like, ooh, look, snakes. Great, go to the zoo, not church. <laughs> you know, do you think Paul wanted to get bit by a snake? Or do you think he was trying to prove something? Like, all right, everybody, watch this. No, of course not. I suppose the snake handling preachers, if they really wanted to get biblical, would allow themselves to get bit and then see how spiritual they are, since that is what Paul does in Scripture, after all. This bit about drinking poison is a little different as well because uh, we don't actually have any New Testament examples of this sign. Uh, but that really just proves to us that these signs are not as important as some might think. Um, we never read of Paul or Peter or any other guy drinking poison. So the point of this passage is this. God is taking care of his own. That's the point. The point of this passage is for the newly commissioned disciples to know that their task in taking the gospel to all nations will be dangerous. They're, if you're in a job where every now and then you have to get bit by a snake and drink poison, it's a dangerous job. He's saying, this is going to be rough, guys. This is going to be really rough. You will be persecuted, but you will be cared for until your work is done. Not only would they be cared for, but God would let them care for others. The passage continues and says they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And again, this is something that Jesus did a lot of in conjunction with his preaching. He healed the sick. He cared for the sick. His disciples would too. And he believe, we believe that God can heal the sick and that he answers prayer and that we as Christians should care for the sick because Jesus did. 
There are many instances in the book of Acts of the disciples supernaturally healing the sick. But again, do not think of this as evidence of orthodoxy. Uh, do not expect this as a standalone ministry. Now, I believe that even healing, even, that every healing exists for the glory of God. Uh, in Acts, men and women were healed, and then the believers were encouraged, and unbelievers were converted, and God received praise. And that's the point of the whole thing. There is a purpose in these things that is a heavenly purpose, and it goes, there is a purpose that always goes beyond the individual. Um, the preaching of the gospel is for every creature and for the glory of God. Verse 19, moving into the black letters now. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Now, that's a doctrinally packed verse, isn't it? Jesus ascended into heaven. He didn't stay here on earth. And he had told the disciples in John 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. That's the Holy Spirit. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So even though the disciples would have rather had Jesus stick around, he's a nice guy to have around, it was for their benefit that he went to the Father. For one thing, the, future, the faith of future generations wouldn't be tied to a physical presence walking on this earth, but rather the working of the Holy Spirit in the church wherever it meets. We say that Jesus is with us. Physically, he is not. That he has taken a seat at the right hand of the Father. And you know when it's time to sit down, right? It's when your job's done. You get to go home and sit down. And that's what Jesus did. He went home and he sat down because his work was done. His work was finished, and that gave the disciples, and it gives us, the basis for the work that's cut out for us. Jesus' work is done. We're just telling people that it's finished. Just the mailman here. Verse 20, last verse in the book. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word throughout the accompanying signs. The disciples preached. They did what they were told. And you can see that the signs weren't from them, but for them. It was the Lord working with them. And it was the Lord that was confirming the word through the accompanying signs. This is the purpose of signs, of miracles, of supernatural stuff. It's not just so people can go, wow. It's so people can see that the word of God is real and they can come to faith in Christ. So the disciples preached. Now, of course, the details for this book would fill another book. The details for this verse, excuse me, would fill another book, and it's called the book of Acts. It's right after John, right before Romans. Go ahead and read it. Uh, those men who j saw Jesus go up into heaven started preaching, and then the people they preached to started preaching, and then people got saved, and those saved people started preaching, and it has not stopped yet. Amen. Don't let it stop here. The book ends here. The book ends in verse 20. The story does not. Um, in fact, do you see that last word there? The very last word of the book of Mark, amen. Okay, you, you know what amen means? It doesn't just mean time to eat. Um, it means a little, little bit more than that. The word amen there, it means different things when it's said at different ends of a sentence. Jesus would often start a statement by saying amen. In our English translation, it's usually translated, most assuredly I say unto you. That's amen, amen, two of them. The Old King James, it's verily, verily. Amen, amen. And when it's spoken at the beginning of a statement, it means the thing that I'm about to say is really, really, truly, truly true. And when it's said at the end of something, it means something slightly different. In addition to saying what was just said is true, it means let this be true. It's looking forward to something. When you say amen at the end of a prayer, you're saying with the Beatles, let it be. Okay, that's what amen means. You're saying, let this be so. Let this be true. I agree with, you know, my brother and sister who prayed this. I agree. I said, let this be so. When Mark closes his gospel with a declaration that the disciples went out and preached the gospel and God worked with them and God took care of them and God confirmed their message, he's saying, amen, let this be, let this continue. He's not saying amen as, you know, the Christianese for prayer over. 
He, it's more like, wait and see what happens next. The disciples preached. Amen. Let the disciples preach. Are you a disciple? Then don't let the amen mean the end. Amen? Amen. 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 I agree. Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Let's pray. God, we praise you for everything that you are and everything you've done for us. We praise you. Uh, for being a kind and loving God that cares for your people. God, we want to be the kind of servants that, that continue your work. Uh, so lead us, please. Lead us in those good works that you've prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Uh, lead us in the paths of righteousness for your namesake. And let each one here be able to answer this call to preach and to go and to serve and to love. Do bless us with whatever you've got. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand? We'll sing a song.